Okay, so time is coming. Like, uh, let me officially like uh, introduce Professor and Doctor like Moritz, like from Lehigh University. Um, so, uh, Doctor Keith Moritz is right now an associate professor in the Department of Mechanical Engineering and me me Mechanics at the Lehigh University. He received his bachelor, master, like you know, a bachelor of arts in physics and a bachelor of science in aerospace, as well as his PhD from University, University of Virginia. He was a postdoc like uh, at a lecturer in mechanical, like aerospace engineer at Princeton, like from 2010 and 2013. And in 2012, like uh, he uh, like later started his independent, like, you know, career in the, like uh, in, 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 in like, Lehigh University. Unlike me as a domestic, like an underground, like a dog chain in the lab, like underneath, actually uh, Keith is a, quite adventure, like, you know, you can see from his, like, you know, introduction, he actually sailed as a faculty on semester at a sea on the, in, on the, for the engineering, like a main master, a short-term voyage through South and Central America, which I assume is a very exciting experience. Um, right now, uh, Dr. Moritz research inter uh, interest, like a focus on bio-inspired propulsion, unsteady aerodynamic, and uh, like a full structure interaction. He's currently a PI for a large like OAR mirror topic on non-traditional non proportion. And he has also, has also received an NSF Korea award for a lot of like his exciting work, like a uh, like, uh, uh, swarm of like, you know, uh, swimmers. So with that, I will give the floor to um, Dr. Murray for his like, you know, exciting talk ahead, please. Well, thank you very much for the nice introduction. Um, Today, I'm going to be talking about the hydrodynamics of fish schooling um, from physics based to deep learning models. So I always have to start with uh, all the people who actually did the work right I mean as a as a faculty member. Um, you know, unfortunately, I don't get a chance to do as much work as I would like, um, but I have some great students and postdocs and some that have moved on to, to postdocs from being students. That have actually done the work I'm going to be talking about today. So, in terms of the students, um, currently there's a student, Pedro Armand, who's working in uh, in the research group, who's done. Uh, I'm going to show some of his results from schooling interactions. Um, Melike Kurt, who was a former graduate student who did some work, and we're going to talk about a lot of her results that she got as a PhD student. She's now a postdoc over at the University of Southampton. Um, Chung Zhang was, was a PhD student with Dan Quinn at the University of Virginia, um, and he has some, some of his work is actually in here as well. Um, Eamon Mavechi is currently a postdoc here at Lehigh, and uh, we're going to be talking about some scaling laws that he developed. Um, I also have collaborators on the ONR Muri project that we've been working with for several of these um, projects. Uh, the ONR Muri project is led by Hilary Bart Smith, there's myself, Hai Bo Dong, Lex Smith, Clancy Rowley. Uh, Frank Fish and George Louder that are on this project, and you all probably know uh, most of these people, I'm assuming. Um, for some of the machine learning work at the end, I actually did have a chance to do some work myself. I actually worked at a summer faculty fellowship program working with Jonathan Tu at the Navy. Um, and so actually some of the, the latter work on machine learning stuff um, had, has to be approved for public release, and, and some of our most recent work has not yet been approved. So I'll show you some older results, unfortunately, on that front. But, uh, but that work was done in collaboration with uh, Jonathan too. Uh, Dan Quinn uh, has been helping us and collaborating with us um, with some scaling law work uh, with Chung Zong and, and Eamon as well. Um, our work generally that I'm gonna be talking about today has been funded through the Office of Naval Research as well as the National Science Foundation. So generally I do work in unsteady flows and I'm sure everybody here kind of knows where unsteady flows occur, but just to, to kind of give this as the, the kind of starting point, um, unsteady flows occur all throughout nature and the engineering world. We see them in the locomotion of animals, so the flight of the hummingbird or swimming of dolphins or fish. Um, and we see it not just in, in, in the locomotion of an isolated swimmer, but also when these swimmers or flyers get in groups. So in uh, fish schools, we see unsteady flow interactions and bird flocks as well. Um, and there are biorobotic um, implementations of these types of swimmers, such as ghost swimmer, or more recently, the tuna bot, that use in an engineering world, use these kind of unsteady flow interactions. There's also classical um, engineering uh, situations where unsteady flow interactions occur, like uh, in the coaxial rotor system of the Sikorsky Vader, or in vertical axis wind turbines, or in interactions with the atmospheric boundary layer and, high, and horizontal axis turbines. 
Um, infamously in the Tacoma Narrows Bridge disaster, we've seen it, we see it happening there as well. And on larger scales and geophysical flows, we see unsteady flows occurring, for instance, in the vortex shedding pattern here around Guadalupe Island. So we're going to focus today more on the biological locomotion aspect of unsteady flows. Um, and so to do that, we have to start off with a little bit of bioinspiration. So this is uh, a video from the Okinawa Aquarium. They have a large tank, just like the Georgia Aquarium, that has whale sharks and manta rays and stingrays and tuna, all sorts of different fish in here. But it's amazing just to see how graceful uh, these animals can propel themselves and with, how, and with a whole array of different locomotion strategies. But don't let that fool you. These animals can be incredibly agile and maneuverable at the same time. Uh, this manta ray is actually stealing the diving camera from this diver, turning on a dime and accelerating away um, with an amazing amount of agility. So if we can harness these kinds of capabilities, this agility, this maneuverability, as well as the speed and efficiency of animal locomotion, then we can really think about developing the next generation of underwater vehicle. Uh, to begin, we have to kind of classify what kind of locomotion we're talking about. And the, the um, starting point for that typically is classifying based on the Reynolds number. Um, and everybody knows, you know, here I'm assuming that the uh, Reynolds number is the ratio of the inertial forces to the viscous forces in a flow. And uh, we're going to talk about high Reynolds number flows. And by high Reynolds number, what I mean is things on the order of 10 to the 3 to 10 to the 7. So that kind of encompasses um, whale swimming, human swimming for that matter, uh, manta rays, sea lions, great white sharks, but also some smaller things, um, uh, fish and fish schools as well. Um, we won't be talking about low Reynolds number locomotion like E. coli, which is Reynolds numbers on the order of 10 to the minus 5 to 10 to the minus 2. So we're focusing in the high Reynolds number realm. Uh, so thinking about the application of studying biological locomotion, we're really thinking about the development of the next generation of underwater vehicle. And we can compare biology and bioinspired vehicles to traditional propeller-based vehicles. Um, and we do this comparison. We see that the speeds can be comparable. The efficiencies are comparable. Biology can, can potentially do a little bit better. Um, but it starts to be more starkly different when we look at the turning radii are, are much uh, smaller for biology and bioinspired um, devices. The turning rates can be much higher. And I think an important characteristic, um, at least for the Navy's perspective, is that if you uh, properly build a bioinspired device, you can achieve a fish like noise signature. And that makes it extremely difficult to detect. Uh, it basically has an acoustic camouflage that blends in with a natural, natural background radiation, making these, these devices hard to detect. Now, there's been significant advances in recent years, for instance, in bioinspired devices like the TunaBot um, that get closer to the biological uh, metrics of performance. But we're really thinking in terms of the next step of actually having not just a single one of these devices swimming, but thinking about a school of these devices um, swimming together. And the idea there is kind of twofold. One is that we can take advantage of hydrodynamic benefits, so we can actually have better performance by swimming in a school than swimming in isolation but also that we can then perform novel kind of distributed tasks. So not just have a single device, but many devices that can, that can uh, do these kind of distributed tasks in a, in a given mission, if you're thinking about this from the Navy's perspective. So focusing a little bit more on schooling, um, I have this nice video here, courtesy of George Lauder uh, over at Harvard. So he has a small fish school here in one of his flow channels, um, and he's actually changing the flow speed here. And there's a couple of key variables you need to think about in terms of schooling, um, one of which is the organization or the relative spacing between these swimmers, and the other is the synchronization, the kind of phase difference between their, their tail beam motions in this case. And you can see here as the speed is increasing more and more, um, we start to get uh, structures that actually will start to shift um, as we get to some higher speeds. We see swimmers kind of swimming in the line, kind of two lines in a sense here, but that now starts to take on kind of a diagonal formation here. Um, so, you know, these two variables are two things to kind of uh, really keep in mind for how the flow interactions are going to be occurring between these fish. And whenever I see a video like this, um, you know, I start to think about the, the kind of common, I would say, uh, driving research questions in, in fish schooling, you know, what are energetically optimal arrangements or synchronizations, and what are also, you know, uh, force enhancing or speed enhancing schooling states, and do fish actually take advantage of these? Um, and what are the flow physics behind these different benefits? So I would say these are kind of the common questions that people come into with schooling um, problems. 
But there was another idea that was posed by Lighthill in 1975, and he did it kind of as a joke, but he wrote in his book uh, that essentially that perhaps the fish aren't trying to achieve some sort of energetic advantage or some force production advantage, but perhaps it's just the forces uh, between the hydrodynamic forces between the fish that are kind of pushing and pulling them into a specific arrangement, kind of like the atoms in a crystal lattice, right? And so that's an, a, an interesting proposition that maybe the arrangements we see aren't due to um, fish trying to, to gain an advantage per se, but they just kind of naturally pulled or pushed into different configurations. So this has become one of our driving research questions as well. Um, in my research group, and we're essentially looking at whether there are stable arrangements or configurations that are mediated by the, the hydrodynamic forces. And so these are the three basic questions that we focus on um, when we're looking at schooling problems. We want to know what are energetically optimal or force enhancing um, schooling states. What are the flow physics behind that? What are the stable schooling states? Are there stable schooling states? And, and why do those exist? So we're going to talk about all three of these questions um, throughout today's talk. To kind of lay the groundwork, we're going to have um, kind of a common set of variables and parameters that are used throughout uh, the work I'm going to talk about today across several studies. So we're going to lay this out kind of as a primer to begin with. So imagine that we have just a generic fish-like swimmer. Um, the fish-like swimmer uh, in this case is, is, has a caudal fin and it's going to be propelling itself with this tail fin. So it's going to oscillate its tail fin with some frequency f and some peak-to-peak -peak amplitude a. Um, in the process, it's going to shed a vortex wake, impart momentum to the fluid, and generate uh, propulsive force to swim forward with some speed u. The, uh, you can think about some length scales here associated with the fish. You can think about the body length scale, just the, the total length, or you can think about the, the cord length of the propulsor itself. Um, and when we think about just an individual hydrofoil, we think about the length scale just being the cord length of that foil. Uh, the Struhol number is a dimensionless number that's really the ratio of these two wake um, length, uh, length scales, the wake wavelength, which is U over F, and the uh, approximate wake width, which is the peak-to-peak -peak amplitude. Uh, and so this is one uh, dimensionless variable you'll see throughout this, this kind of biolocomotion literature. Um, we also talk about the reduced frequency as well, just being a dimensionless frequency and a dimensionless amplitude um, as well. We're going to be using uh, and talking about uh, the time average forces and particularly the time average thrust force. And we can normalize the time average thrust force uh, by the added mass forces and define a thrust coefficient. Um, we can also define it more classically based on dynamic pressure kind of scaling in the uh, normalization in the denominator. And there's just a simple relationship between the two with the Struhol number squared. Um, we We'll also, in these interaction studies, talk about a normalized thrust. So this is taking the thrust from a, the time average thrust from a swimmer and normalizing it by the time average thrust from the swimmer if it's swimming by itself in isolation. So if this ratio is one, then uh, a swimmer that has some interactions happening with other swimmers would be producing the same thrust force as if they were in isolation. If it's greater than one, it's receiving a thrust benefit. If it's less than one, it's a thrust degradation in that case. Uh, for the power, we look at kind of a similar, uh, similar normalizations. We can normalize the time average power based on the added mass power and define a power coefficient. We can define it based on dynamic pressure, and there's a simple relationship between the two. Uh, and again, we could define a normalized power in the same way that we did the normalized thrust. Uh, the efficiency turns out to be the ratio of the thrust and power coefficients, regardless of which normalization we use, dynamic pressure or added mass forces. It, it turns out to be the same thing. Um, and we can also, uh, and we'll also talk about this normalized efficiency as well. Okay, so that's kind of the groundwork, the, the get everybody on board with the same variables and so forth. Um, and what I want to start off with is, is actually talking about this idea of in-plane schooling, and we're going to focus on the stability and the hydrodynamic benefits for in-plane schooling. Assuming I can go forward, there we go. So, uh, so this is actually work done by Mella K. Kurt when she was a PhD student. Um, we have a paper up on archive right now um, that's under review uh, currently. And this work, uh, in this work, we're looking at the in-plane schooling scenario. And this was, these were experiments actually done in our flow channel here, at, one of our flow channels here at Lehigh. Um, this is the basic schematic of what the experiment was. We had two foils in our channel, a leader foil and a follower foil. 
Um, we installed a splitter plate and a surface plate. So these two um, were uh, close to the, the wing tips of these hydrofoils. Um, so there's a very small gap between them. And this uh, confined the flow to be nominally two-dimensional. And so we, we got an approximately two-dimensional flow out of this um, scenario. Um, we varied or we fixed the leader in one position and we varied the follower through a whole range of positions. And so uh, these grid points here represent all of the positions that we took data at for the, the, the follower. And so these, uh, the X star and Y star variable are two kind of major variables in this study. Um, X star is the, the distance from the leading edge of the leader to the leading edge of the follower, normalized by the cord length. Um, so it's a dimensionless X position. And the same thing for the dimensionless Y position, it's normalized by the cord length and it's relative again to the the leader uh, leading edge. We have cases in here that are that fall into the kind of typical inline cases as well as side by side cases, and then a whole bunch of staggered cases um, that are kind of mixtures of those two kinds of cases, canonical cases. Uh, so for our input variables and parameters, um, like I said, X star and Y star are the major variables here. We change them in the ranges that you see here, which are is visually represented up here in these grid points. Um, we fix the synchrony in this case, uh, and mostly because <laughs> because there's already a lot of measurements happening here, um, and so you know we're going to fix the synchrony to be one uh, particular synchronization um, of a phase difference between the leader and follower of pi, or or an out of phase um, synchronization. Um, the aspect ratio is effectively infinite in the sense that the the flow is confined to be uh, two dimensional. We fixed all of these um, kinematic and flow uh, parameters. So we have a Reynolds number around 10,000, a Struhal 0.25, reduced frequency of one, dimensionless amplitude around 0.26. Now on the output side, at every one of these grid points, we have you know, one of these nice six axis ATI sensors measuring all the forces and moments. Um, so we get all the forces and moments at every single grid point. And what we're interested in though, are these kind of output quantities. So we're interested in uh, first these, uh, the Delta T and Delta L, these are the relative thrust and relative lift forces. So the relative thrust force is the difference in thrust from the follower and the leader. Um, and the idea here is that if the thrust, if the um, leader and the follower have the same thrust, then if they're freely swimming, they're gonna have the same swimming speed. And if there's a difference in thrust between them, then the two will be um, spreading apart, right? So if the follower has more, it generates more thrust than the leader, it will swim past the leader uh, and, and take off uh, potentially. So what it really tells us is uh, in a frame kind of fixed to the leader, it tells us whether the relative spacing in the X dimension is gonna change if these two uh, hydrofoils are freely swimming. And the same idea applies to this, this uh, relative lift force. It tells us if the relative lift force is zero, then the following the leader's relative spacing is not changing in the y dimension. But if it's something uh, other than zero, then they're going to be either spreading apart or getting closer together. So we're going to use those in just a, in, in the next slide actually to talk about a force map. Um, but after that, we're going to talk about the hydrodynamic benefits as well for schooling in, this, in these in-plane arrangements. We have, um, you know, we can look at the individual performance on the leader or the follower. Um, but we're going to choose, in this case, to look at the collective performance. So this is where we essentially add up the, uh, the thrust, add up the power. And you could think of this, this would be the kind of calculation you would do if these two hydrofoils were attached to the same device, right? Both thrusts are going to add to the total thrust uh, on that device. So that's kind of one way to think about this collective performance. Um, but here we're actually going to take the, the leader um, thrust and the follower thrust, add them together. And when we do a, a normalized thrust uh, coefficient, we're gonna normalize by the uh, thrust of, an ice, of two isolated swimmers, since there's uh, two interacting swimmers in the numerator. So we're gonna do the same thing for the normalized power co collective power coefficient and the ratio of the two is the collective efficient, normalized collective efficiency. Okay, so let's take a look at some of the data. There we go. Uh, so to get you oriented to this plot, um, this plot generally we, we describe this as a force map. Um, the leader is shown here. This is where the leader's position is. Um, all these lines here are uh, the, the this area where the lines are located at is where all those grid points that I showed you in the last slide were located at. 
And so every position here in this field represents a position where the follower can be located at. Um, at every single grid point, we measure these relative forces. And so we have a force field uh, across this grid. And then we draw what we call here uh, our force lines. And so these are lines that are tangent to the um, local relative force vector. And so in that sense, these are very much like streamlines, except this is based on the relative force vector field, not the flow field. And so here, if you imagine that your follower is located at this position, um, what this map tells you is that these are the forces that the follower is going to experience, the time average forces that the follower is going to experience. So it's going to experience a force down, uh, down into the left. So it's going to get pushed down in that direction if it's sitting at that position. If it's sitting uh, over here, it's going to feel a force that pushes it upward or away from the leader to one side. Um, and clearly in this force map, there are some critical points that show up. And so we want to analyze these critical points in a little more detail. So the first one here is associated with this region one, and we can zoom in on it and see it more closely here. Um, and at this red dot, if the father is located there, it's actually an equilibrium position. The, the um, relative forces are zero at that position. And if the follower gets perturbed upward, it feels a force that pulls it back to that equilibrium. And if it gets perturbed downward, it feels a force that, perturbed, that brings it back to that equilibrium again. And same thing if it gets perturbed upstream or downstream, there's a slight, there's a slight angle to these force lines that actually make it stable in the streamwise dimension as well as the cross stream dimension. So this is actually the first experimental evidence that we have that these arrangements can be two-dimensionally stable. There's been several studies that have seen one-dimensional stability, just the streamwise dimension, um, but this is the first experiment showing two-dimensional stability. So this is a, a pretty uh, cool finding, I think. We can look at some of these other critical points. We can see region two here. Um, we can see in the streamwise dimension, region two is stable. Uh, it's one-dimensionally stable. But in the cross stream dimension, it's unstable. And this represents a saddle point um, topology. Uh, and so it's an unstable saddle point here. If we look at region three, this actually represents an unstable source point. Um, so if the follower is perturbed in either dimension, it gets pushed away from this equilibrium position. And in region four, we see another unstable saddle point happening there as well. So you know, in this uh, you know, map, I uh, found a really cool finding that there's actually a two-dimensionally stable arrangement, but this was done with fully constrained foils. These are the, the foil position for the follower. We move it to different grid points, but at that grid point, it's fixed in place. So in a real free swimming situation, these swimmers are fully unconstrained and there's some recoil motion that happens when they're flapping that alters their kinematics. And potentially it, it could break this whole stability landscape that we see here. And so that's a big question of, whether dynamic recoil motions are going to change this landscape in a way, and maybe there's not a stable point there in reality. And so we need to investigate that more deeply. So to start off, we did this uh, in a simulation environment. So we have our own uh, in-house 2D and 3D potential flow solver, kind of a basic classic panel method based on source elements and doublet uh, elements. Um, and so we use a two-dimensional version of this to just derive a very simple set of simulations. Um, here's an example of one of those simulations. So this is two foils here. Um, the leader foils on the bottom, the follower foils on the top. And you can see the follower foils started at a position that's a little bit behind the leader foil. Now both foils are, are fully unconstrained. Uh, the pitching motion is prescribed, but the translational degrees of freedom in the XY plane in this two dimensional plane are um, solved by the equations of motion. And so we can uh, see that at the beginning here, the follower gets closer to the leader. And then it starts to push away and speed up. And the follower now is actually ahead of the leader. And over time, um, the follower is going to move backward or the leader is going to come forward. Uh, and slowly, they will end up stabilizing into a particular position. And so over here on the right, we're showing a graph of, of uh, this is showing the Y star position of the follower and the X star position of the follower. Um, and then in time, we also color the dots based on time. Uh, we started the follower at a bunch of different initial conditions around this kind of side by side arrangement. And you can see that regardless, it doesn't matter which initial condition we started at, the follower ends up converging to one location, um, which is located at a Y star value 
close to 1.2 in this particular case, and an X star value of zero. So they're in a, a perfectly side-by-side -side arrangement. So this shows that at least in these potential flow simulations, right, that the prediction um, from the constrained foil measurements is accurate. That even with dynamic recoil that's happening in these simulations, we still get this stable side-by-side -side arrangement um, and, and we show that in, in these kinds of cases. But you always wonder about you know, potential flow simulations that are invested in nature. Are we missing something? Is there a disruption um, uh, uh, of this result if we have actual viscous flow in an experiment and it's fully unconstrained? So to answer this question, we decided to build an experiment to look at the unconstrained case. And so um, Pedro Armand is a student that worked on uh, this. And this is a very challenging experiment to do. Um, so what we've done here is we've actually fixed the leader wing or the leader foil in one position, but the follower foil uh, is riding on a dual axis air bearing system. Now the system is fully wireless. Uh, it has batteries on board. So there's no wires that run uh, to this. Um, the air supply is actually riding in these tanks uh, on the actual stage. So there's no air supply tubing running to this um, from an external source. Uh, so everything is on the stage itself. And um, in that sense, there's no additional kind of spring forces or anything added to the, to the platform, which can give you uh, false equilibrium measurements. Uh, these are very tricky measurements. You have to be very careful about the levelness of the setup and the bending even in the rails is, uh, can be a major concern. Uh, so it takes a lot of effort to get this to be done properly. Uh, but Pedro has taken that time and got it to be done very well. Um, our two foils in this case, we removed the splitter and surface plate um, and actually their aspect ratio three, which is not the kind of image that we have here, but the actual experiments are aspect ratio three. Um, on the right here, this shows you the kind of system in action. Um, the leader foil is the foil here, it's fixed in position. The follower foil is riding on this dual axis air bearing stage. Its position in the streamwise and cross stream dimension is not controlled. This is fully uh, free floating. Uh, you could think of it like on an air hockey table, right? It's free floating in, in the, this two dimensional plane. Uh, and it's just being pushed around based on the hydrodynamic forces uh, between the leader and the follower. And there's some flow actually happening in this case too. So these are, uh, when it starts off, it's actually swimming forward um, in this simulation, in this experiment. So here's an example of one experiment that we did. We did a bunch of experiments like this. Um, and this is from a video, we extract the, the foil uh, locations here and just kind of replotted it as this, this video that you see. Um, uh, actually, sorry, the foil positions here are actually measured based on laser distance sensors and then we recreate this in a little video here. Uh, the parameters are the reduced frequency is close to one, true on number close to 0.35, uh, potential sample to 0.36. Um, and this is a typical kind of trajectory that we would get. So this is the exposition of the follower over time. Um, it starts at some location, ends up settling to another location. Uh, same thing with the Y position as well. It starts at some location, ends up settling to another location. And so we did a bunch of measurements like this. And <clears throat> we gathered that data together. Um, and so we actually end up having a range of uh, the phase relationship between the leader and follower. The target is around 180, but it went up to between 170 and 190. Um, and so we color the dots based on that. Uh, and so here's where all of the kind of average, time average positions ended up at these different locations. And we can see that the average position is the follower is just slightly forward of the leader. And it's at an equilibrium Y star position of 0.92. Now in our simulations, we measured an X star equilibrium of zero. And so it's, it's close to that. And a Y star equilibrium of 0.9 and the actual value of the experiments comes out to 0.92. So we get good agreement between the experiments uh, and the simulations for this kind of case. And what you know, I'm showing you here is that the stable arrangement um, actually does exist in these viscous flows and experiments um, that it, it shows up in the constrained foil experiments and in these unconstrained foil experiments, it shows up in unconstrained potential flow simulations, right? So all these things um, are, are kind of cross-validated in that sense. Now, the other thing is that in our experiments, we actually can measure the speed increase as well. And we see that the leader and follower actually have an 18% uh, speed increase to swimming in isolation. So this makes us start thinking about um, what are the benefits really for schooling, these kinds of schooling interactions? So here, if we go back to the constrained foil, the first measurements that I showed you on the constrained foil 
um, cases. Uh, at all those grid points, we had measured not only the relative forces, but also the performance, right? And so we can calculate the power, the thrust, the efficiency, and then the collective uh, versions of those. And so here I'm showing you three contour plots. One is the um, collective thrust, uh, the normalized collective thrust. Uh, we have the normalized collective power and the normalized collective efficiency. Uh, the leaders kind of showed for your reference as to where that's located at. And the red dots are the, the four critical points that, um, that we had found from the force map. So first we can look at this, the stable side-by-side -side arrangement. Um, and we see in terms of the collective thrust that indeed we do get a thrust benefit about, in this case, around an 80% increase, uh, 80 to 90% increase in the thrust, in the collective thrust. Um, and that goes in line with the fact that we measured a speed increase. Um, so a, a thrust benefit is gonna translate to a speed increase if they're freely swimming. We see that uh, there's another region of high uh, thrust production, and that's actually in the inline and slightly staggered arrangements. Um, and particularly in the slightly staggered arrangements, we get nearly 100% increase in the collective thrust. So, so uh, quite an interesting uh, zone as well. If we look at the collective power, we see that for the side-by-side -side arrangement, there's some uh, increase in the collective power there as well that goes with the increase in collective thrust. But for this entire kind of weight zone, everything downstream of the leader, uh, there's not a lot of change in the collective power. It's all around a value of one or what it would be in isolation. A little bit less in some regions here and, and a little bit more over here, but basically around one. What that translates to in terms of collective efficiency is that for the side-by-side -side arrangement, we get um, a modest increase in efficiency. Um, since the thrust and the power both went up, but the thrust went up a little bit more, we get a, a, a 20 to 30% boost in the collective efficiency. Um, but in this uh, slightly staggered arrangement and inline arrangements, we get a much larger increase in efficiency, which is driven by the increase in thrust since the power is staying about the same as what it would be in isolation. So in the slightly staggered arrangement, we get nearly 100% increase in the efficiency and nearly 100% increase in the thrust at the same time. So this is interesting because we see kind of two distinctly different interesting points for schooling arrangements. One is a stable arrangement in the side-by-side -side case that uh, you do get a benefit, but not as much of a benefit as if you go to the slightly I mean, staggered yeah. arrangement, which in the slightly staggered arrangement, um, we get a benefit both in terms of a, a nearly 100% benefit in thrust and efficiency, um, but it's not stable, so you need to use some level of control to kind of maintain that positioning. So we don't know, you know, whether this ultimately translates to real fish or not, and whether fish end up preferring one type of arrangement versus the other, but that's definitely a major question that would be great to, to, to have answered. Um, you know, this also, uh, in this map, we're only changing the position of the follower relative to the leader, and we've fixed all the kinematic variables. And so something else we want to know is how does this kind of uh, hydrodynamic benefit performance scale with changes in the kinematics, um, changes in, in, in the positioning, and we're going to focus on the particular case of the stable side-by-side -side arrangement and understand that more deeply. So we're going to switch gears and talk about some scaling laws now. So we've been de developing scaling laws in my research group for, um, for a little bit now. Um, our first paper on it was really in, in uh, 2018 for an AIAA journal. And we chose a very simple case. We looked at a case of a purely pitching foil um, in isolation. So there's just one foil, not, not multiple foils. Um, and we developed some scaling laws following this basic kind of approach. We started off with classic linear theory based on Garrick's theory um, to predict the thrust and the power. And you know, quickly you realize that it doesn't work um, completely. So there need to be at least some sort of corrections to that classic theory um, to account for the assumptions that are made. And so this is our general approach. We start with classic linear theory, introduce some nonlinear corrections, and get to our scaling laws. So as an example, we have a model for the thrust production for this purely pitching isolated foil. We take uh, the added mass and circulatory thrust forces from classic linear theory, uh, retain those, and we add onto this an additional form drag term, which is a nonlinear correction. And the idea here is that in, in linear theory, you're assuming small amplitude motion, uh, and when we have you know, uh, finite amplitude motion, especially in the case of pure pitching, we're going to have some projected frontal area that will uh, introduce a potential form drag component to this. 
So um, we introduced this nonlinear correction for large amplitudes of motion. Um, the functions phi2 and phi3 are written out explicitly here and here. Um, phi2 just comes from the theory. It's a function of the reduced frequency. You see that there's the Theodorson lift efficiency functions in here as well. It just comes straight from, from classic theory. Um, the phi3 is just simply the dimensionless amplitude um, that relates to this form drag term. For uh, modeling the power, we take the atom mass uh, contribution, uh, power contribution from linear theory, and we add on two nonlinear corrections, a separating and shear layer correction and a vortex, vortex proximity correction. These are added to account for the assumptions of uh, small amplitude motion and the non-deforming weight. And so the first term, the separating shear layer term, um, really accounts for the fact that we have large amplitudes of motion. Uh, the second term accounts for the fact that our wake is actually deforming and not planar, like it's assumed in the theory. And so these are simply the functions P5 and P6 are simply functions of the Struhall number and reduced frequency. Even this K star is just a function of K and, and Struhall number. So I won't go obviously into the details of how we developed this, um, but you can definitely go take a look and see that in more detail. So this was done though for an isolated purely pitching foil. Um, now what we're interested in are the side-by-side -side interactions between two foils that are operating out of phase. So this kind of scenario that you see in the simulation here. So we can actually do these kind of constrained position uh, measurements of two foils operating out of phase and vary this, this distance D star. And we can generate a bunch of data from this um, and you know, vary the kinematics as well, not just the positioning. And we can make plots here of the thrust and the power coefficients and the colors here actually represent the spacing. So black is when they're very far apart, nearly in isolation. White is when they're very close together. Um, we can now see if our 2D scaling laws, our, our purely pitching scaling laws for an isolated foil will work on these two interacting foils. We don't expect them to, but we can at least start there and see where, see where we're at. So we can take and plot our, our scaling law for thrust, let's say, on the x-axis and, and look at the actual thrust coefficient on the y-axis. And uh, what we would expect is if the scaling law captures the actual data well, that all the data will fall on a line of slope one, saying that we have an equality statement between these two. Um, what we see is that when we plot our, our um, isolated foil scaling law, that it does provide some regularity to the data. And the data, if you look at individual color, it does parallel this line. But clearly, there's a stratification based on the color, which is based on the spacing between the foils. And that's obvious that that wouldn't be accounted for because we didn't add anything yet to the scaling law. We can see the same thing for the, the power as well. So we clearly need to account for um, this spacing and think about how that changes the interactions between the two foils. So there's two effects that, two physical effects that need to be accounted for in these interactive foils. The first one is an atom mass amplification as the two foils get close to each other. This comes from classic hydrodynamic theory. Um, for instance, you can find this in, in Brennan's report in 1982. Um, and the basic idea is that if a foil gets close to a ground plane or close, close to another foil, um, its atom mass is going to increase. And it's going to increase uh, following this kind of power series solution. Um, or the series solution. This is going to uh, go like one over d star squared and then one over d star to the fourth and to the sixth and so forth. Um, we're going to take the, the leading order term, the one over d star squared term as our atom mass amplification and drop the, the higher order terms uh, for our case. The other thing we need to account for is the reduction in the influence of the vortex wake on, um, on a foil. And the idea comes from uh, this kind of, you can imagine it coming from this kind of schematic. We have the solid foil here as our follower foil, the dashed uh, foil here is our leader foil. Since we're operating out of phase, we shed a blue vortex from the follower and a red vortex from the leader. And the blue vortex is going to induce some velocity on the follower. And the red vortex is going to induce um, not quite a, a, an equal and opposite velocity, but something close or nearly close to that, that's actually going to reduce the influence of the blue vortex back on the follower. So the wake influence from the follower's wake on itself is going to be reduced by the presence of the vortex shed from the leader. And so we can step through and account for this in our scaling law and our vortex proximity term and, and introduce the leader vortex presence uh, in this case. So now we can write out our new scaling laws that account for these interactions. Um, our thrust scaling law 
we, uh, both the thrust and power, we introduced a new term, this uh, term two and term six. These are the zeta two and zeta six are one over d star squared is the function. So these are the added mass amplification terms. Um, the eighth term is a, modif is a modified version of our original term. Um, and we modify it based on this um, presence of the, the uh, leader vortex in this case. So now we can go back to our data. And uh, this is just replotting what we had before. So this is our scaling law for uh, the isolated case. And now we can introduce the atom mass amplification term. And if we introduce the atom mass amplification term, we see that we've now captured the thrust uh, very well. And the power has gotten good, um, but could potentially be better. Um, if we add in our vortex proximity scaling, we now see that the power collapses really well and the thrust collapses really well as well. So, um, you know, we're able to capture the right physics in our scaling model and introduce that into in, in, in these additional terms that now account for these out of phase side by side interactions. But, uh, you know, this is done with our invested simulation data. And so how does this actually work on experimental data? So we have two sets of experiments here. One is uh, from Chung down at uh, UVA, or when he was down uh, as a grad student at UVA. He took the data in the top row here. And then at Lehigh, we took some data um, in the bottom row here. And you could see this is in this experimental data that, again, we get uh, not as good of a collapse, but we still get a good collapse of the data. And in fact, uh, the scanning laws can predict experimental data to within 20% um, accuracy. So what I'm showing you here is that we're able to capture the major physics and, and be able to model these interactions, at least for this side-by-side out-of-phase case. Now, this is only looking at two FOIL interactions, right? And in a real school, we have to think about what happens when you scale up to many swimmers, not just uh, have two swimmers interacting. So we want to have a way to uh, both scale up our scaling law analysis to many swimmers, um, but also just even thinking about the data that we've been gathering from two foil interactions or, or small numbers of interactions and being able to uh, project what that means for many swimmers. Uh, so the basic approach that we've been working on here is to think about introducing a deep learning model to do this, to actually train the deep learning uh, model on two or three body interactions and be able to predict n body interactions. So maybe that's four, maybe that's 10, maybe that's 100. Right? And so that's the, the kind of thought or idea. Um, so we have uh, run a bunch of simulations for two body and three body um, training sets. Um, we decided to fix the phase now to be in phase. And the reasoning there is that as we scale up the number of swimmers, um, it's a lot simpler to not have the phase change. And so every swimmer has zero phase, uh, regardless of the number of swimmers that we have. Um, but we ran, ran a bunch of simulations of the two-body case and the three-body case. Let's see if we can get this to run. There we go. Um, where we vary the relative spacings between the two or three swimmers. And we use that data to then train a neural network. And hopefully, we can predict what happens in the four-body simulation case. That's the, uh, that's the basic approach. So first. Um, we wanted to see whether there's a simpler approach for, rather than doing a deep neural network. We wanted to think about, is there some, some simpler approach that we could take? Um, and so we started off with a very naive approach and developed a naive uh, superposition model, something very simple. Now, the basic idea here was that if we go to three body simulations, is this just the sum of two two body interactions, right? So if, for instance, wanted to know the lift on swimmer one, is this just simply uh, what we would get if we added together the lift that we get if swimmer one and swimmer two are interacting by themselves and swimmer zero and swimmer one are interacting by themselves? Is it just the sum of those two lifts? If we just take two body data, can we predict what's happening here? That was kind of the basic uh, question. And you know, you wouldn't think that that would actually work. Um, I, at least I wasn't, I didn't think it would work at first. So, so we decided just to try it anyway and, and see what we got. So this you know, just writes out mathematically what I'm saying there uh, in words. Um, we have two-body data that takes into account the interaction for swimmer zero and one, and two-body data that it takes into account the interaction for swimmer one and two. And can we then predict what happens in the three-body simulation? Well, uh, here, I'll show you 
uh, a case. Um, so if we wanted to predict the lift on swimmer one, um, the left plot here is a surface plot that we have a variation in the distances between swimmer zero and one and variation in the distances between swimmer one and two. And we try to predict the lift using the superposition based model based only on two body data. And so you generate the surface that you see here. Uh, the little hat uh, character here represents the prediction when there's no hat, it's the actual data from a three, in this case, a three body simulation. So we ran an actual three body simulation or many of them as we varied the distances and we recovered uh, this surface. So we see that if you look at these two, they look precisely the same and they are pretty close to each other in reality. Um, so in this case, if we wanted to measure the lift acting on swimmer one, we can get away with a simple superposition model for you know any of these any of the distances relative distances in this range, so it works uh, really well for this case, which was very surprising. But it doesn't always work so well, so we need to look at some other cases as well. If we look at the thrust on swimmer two, uh, this graph here represents the predicted thrust based on the superposition model, and this plot here represents the actual data from three body simulations. So we see clearly there's a distinctive peak that shows up in the actual data. Uh, that just is not in the two body data at all and is not in the superposition model at all. Now, if you look at the kind of broad trend, the superposition model generally captures that, um, you know, it just doesn't capture this kind of local interaction happening here. So you might think, oh, okay, well, it doesn't do great here, but it's not terrible either. Well, it gets worse for some other cases. So if we look at this case here of the efficiency on swimmer one, um, if we bring the swimmer uh, zero and one close together and swimmer two and one close together, that's moving up to the left on this graph. And based on the superposition model, it would predict that we get over a 20% increase in efficiency. Well, in the actual simulations, the trend is completely the opposite. We get a 20% degradation in the efficiency. And so this tells us a couple of things. One, the superposition model may work in some cases, but in general, it's not going to work. Two, we have gone, the superposition model has all the information from two body simulations. Here, this kind of major shift in the trend tells us that just by adding a third swimmer, it reveals completely new physics that are not present in two body interactions. So if we've only studied two body interactions, we don't know enough to understand what happens for large schools of swimmers. So we need to start thinking about scaling up the number of swimmers and understanding interactions beyond just the two uh, that's commonly done in literature, and really the next step is, is moving to more than two swimmer interactions. Still, uh, we kind of expected the superposition model wouldn't really work, so we're going to turn our attention now to a, a better model. Um, and really, the key here is is we're going to use we're going to use three body data, which has some of these additional interactions present in it, to be able to train in this case a deep neural network. Um, so kind of our first step into this realm is to just develop a deep learning model, train it on some three body simulation data, and then try to predict some other three body simulation data first. If we can't do that, then we have no hope of going to, to more bodies. Um, and then the step after that would be to take the, the model trained on three body simulations and see if we can predict what happens in four body interactions. Now our basic model that we started off with is, is one where we kept the superposition kind of base model, but then we said, you know, there's definitely, um, it's definitely not right in all cases, uh, but it could be the, the right answer if we add to it some residual term, right? So what's the difference between the actual solution and the superposition prediction? And that's this residual term. So we decided to train our neural network on this residual data. Um, and we decided to build a feature vector that would be independent of the number of swimmers so that we can train it on three and use it for 100 swimmers. The way that we built our feature vector is we decided to look at a nearest neighbor interaction kind of model. So this is the base feature vector. And the idea here is we have a D star two minus, D star one minus, D star one plus, D star two plus. What these represent are the swimmers to the left or to the bottom and to the top of an individual swimmer. So if we're thinking about swimmer two, let's say, um, this feature vector would be built up of D star two minus, which is looking at two swimmers below swimmer two, so that'd be swimmer zero. And we're looking at the distance between swimmer two and swimmer zero. Uh, then we would look at D star one minus, which is one swimmer below swimmer two and looking at that distance. 
Um, and then for D star one plus, we're looking at one swimmer above, and D star two plus, we're looking at two swimmers above. But in this case, if we have four bodies, uh, there isn't a swimmer above, uh, two above swimmer two. So for that kind of case, what we give for the D star value is just a, a, a large value for it. So in, in particular, we give it a value around 10 or 12. And the reason why we chose that is based on our two body simulation data, we see that around 10, um, the swimmers are far enough apart that there's effectively zero interactions happening between them. So if we just give a kind of a ghost swimmer at a very large value, um, we can fill in the feature vector and its effect should be nothing on the actual interaction case. But you know, if we just use this as the feature vector, um, it's not going to be very good. There's no nonlinearities introduced into this. It's just a bunch of linear distances between swimmers. So we build up nonlinear features, and we do this based on our physical intuition developed from our scaling laws. So we know in these interaction cases that with an atom mass amplification, the, um, the scaling should go like 1 over d star squared. If we actually looked more closely at our vortex proximity uh, term, we actually find that that goes like 1 over d star. So we can then just suppose here that our base feature vector should, should have features like that. So one over D star, one over D star squared, maybe some high order versions of those, the cubic one over you know, D star to the third, one over D star to the fourth. Um, we also added on some positive powers uh, beyond the base vector, um, which uh, actually doesn't work very well, uh, which is not maybe that surprising, I guess. But, um, but we did it at first just for symmetry, a symmetry case. but. Um, in our newest version, we've dropped some of these higher order positive powers. Um, <clears throat> in terms of our uh, network architecture, um, we have 32 feature inputs. We have six hidden layers. Um, we have 16 activation units per hidden layer. We use uh, regularized linear units for the activation unit. Um, there's actually, I should have changed this, there's actually um, a neural network built for the thrust and the lift and the power all separately. So there's three neural networks. And in that sense, there's three outputs, but each neural network has one output. We use adaptive stochastic gradient descent with batching to minimize the cost function of the neural network. We train it for about 5,000 epochs. And we'll take, um, in this kind of original set of data here, we'll take 80% uh, of the three-body simulation data, reserve 20% for testing, um, and take a look at that. Now this is this is actually older data. Like I said, I don't have the um, the new data uh, ready for public release yet, unfortunately. So I'm going to show you some older data. Um, our newer data is much better, uh, but this this is where we were a while ago. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the case of three body interactions for for swimmer zero, one, and uh, two. The top row is the the case for swimmer the data for swimmer two. The middle row is swimmer one. The bottom row is swimmer zero. This the neural network's been trained on some three body simulations. And here we're showing the kind of testing cases that were reserved and seeing how well the neural network can predict um, the other three body cases. Um, and we're plotting the predicted value versus the actual data um, in the same, in this kind of way. So the first column is thrust, the second column is lift, the third column is efficiency. Um, and in general, we see that the neural network does really well. Um, the case here on the external swimmer two and external swimmer zero, um, there's more scatter happening there, but the values are actually quite close to the prediction. If you look at a, the predicted value here, for instance, it's about 0.93, and the actual value is about 0.95. So it's really not that different in terms of magnitude um, for the prediction. So the neural network does well. Um, it's trained on three body data. It's not surprising to predict other three body data pretty well. But we want to know what happens on four body data. So we'll take our first crack at it um, here. And uh, the top row here is actually looking at the individual performance um, of the swimmers. So there's four swimmers now in the school. Um, and so we just lump them all into one plot instead of separating them out as individual swimmers. And um, in this plot, the colors here represent the mean distance between the swimmers, and the sizing represents the mean distance as well. So the large blue dots are when the swimmers are far away, and the small yellow dots are when they're close together. Um, and here we're looking at thrust, lift, and efficiency based on the individual performance data of the swimmers. Um, if you look at the thrust, uh, it doesn't do a great job. Some of the data here is well captured. A whole bunch of data up here isn't really well captured by the model. 
Um, if we look at lift, we see that it does better. If the swimmers are far away, it does a pretty good job. If the swimmers are close together, it starts to deviate from the prediction. Um, and for the efficiency, efficiency, it looks pretty poor, really. Um, there's two kind of groupings here of data. And if the swimmers are far away from each other, kind of these big blue dots, it doesn't do too poorly. Um, but clearly for some of the cases where it gets close, at least, uh, it, it does quite, uh, doesn't do very well in terms of predicting what's going on. But this is the individual performance. We can look at the collective performance. And you might think that if the individual is not great, that the collective would be not great. And it turns out the collective is always a little bit better than the individual performance. So it's kind of an interesting feature. Um, here, we can look at the collective performance prediction for the thrust. And we can see that as the swimmers are far away, it does a great job of predicting the collective performance. And as they get closer together, it begins to deviate. But the deviation is not too bad. Um, the predicted value here is 0.7. The actual value is 0.77. So it's off by about 10%. Um, so it's actually not that bad in terms of predicting thrust. Lift here, it looks bad. But in reality, it's actually quite good. Um, and the reason why it looks so bad is because all the lift, the collective lift values are around 0. And the largest, roughly the largest value that's predicting is a value of minus 0 0.06 lift coefficient which is actually really tiny, right? When you start to think about lift coefficients, you can think about a steady foil at an angle of attack. If it was generating a lift of 0 0.06, that would be about half a degree angle of attack. And so the, the model is actually accurate to within half a degree of an angle of attack, which I think is quite good um, in, in terms of the lift, especially given that the individual lifts are quite large, lift coefficients up around one and a half at the kind of peak values there. In terms of the efficiency, uh, again, if the swimmers are far away, it does a reasonable job. Um, as they get close together, it begins to deviate. Um, there seems to be a nice structure to this, too. Uh, and if we look at the actual values, the actual data shows a value of a, a, fish, a normalized efficiency around 1.25. And the predicted value is about uh, 1.5. So it's off by about 20% in the efficiency case. So it's not as bad as it may seem. Um, so it's actually. Uh, not too bad in terms of the collected data. We can see that uh, we can predict the thrust and efficiency performance to within about 20% using this kind of scaling up approach. Um, I will say that uh, this, this is old data, um, and this is not the best. But some of our newer stuff looks uh, much nicer. So you should wait till that comes out. There's one thing you can actually do. In fact, let me step back to the previous slide. Um, we start to notice, if you look at the individual performance, there's some structure in this data, right? It seems like the data is kind of grouping together as one group here, another group here, one group here, another group here on the individual performance. And we can actually look at um, this in a different way. So here I'm making a plot of the actual um, normalized efficiency versus the normalized thrust. So we're kind of combining those two plots together effectively. Um, we've drop the predictive predictions in this case, just looking at the actual data. And we're coloring this based on the swimmer number. And so uh, it's clear that we get two groupings of data in terms of thrust and efficiency performance here. And in fact, they if you look at them more closely, they're grouped based on the, the interior swimmers and the exterior swimmers. And so these two swimmers here are the interior swimmers on the inside of the school. And the two exterior swimmers are on the edge of the outside of the school in this case. And we see that there's a major distinction in terms of the physics that's happening for these two types of swimmers. Um, and the exterior swimmers are higher performance. They have uh, higher efficiency and higher thrust um, than the interior swimmers. So any kind of future models that want to capture these, this, this, these effects better and scale up to more swimmers should really start thinking about this kind of distinction in, the, in, in these two types of swimmers and probably build neural networks for each one, for the exterior and the interior swimmers um, separately. So uh, I've shown you a lot of things today. Um, I started off by showing you that uh, we, we've now seen in three different cases in constrained foil measurements and unconstrained potential flow simulations and in some unconstrained experiments that side-by-side -side arrangements are actually two-dimensional stable for pitching hydrofoils uh, using out-of-phase synchronizations. Um, they also get a boost in their swimming speed and thrust and efficiency at that arrangement. Uh, I showed you that um, a follower foil in a slightly staggered arrangement can achieve even higher thrust and efficiency benefits, collective thrust and efficiency benefits that are nearly double what they would be in isolation. 
Um, I've shown you scaling laws uh, that take into account an atom mass amplification and a awake influence reduction um, as kind of critical elements to modeling the thrust and power um, of the side-by-side out-of-phase arrangement. And lastly, I showed you uh, a deep learning model that's trained on a few, uh, few body interactions and can be projected at least up to four swimmers um, to within 20% um, accuracy. So that's all I have for you today. Um, with that, are there any questions? So I will, on behalf of the like, you know, the core and like give like physical plus, like uh, remotely. <laughs> so, and uh, <laughs> given a time, uh, given a time, I will actually first pick some question like uh, in summary and uh, raise up and then like open the floor to the uh, to the audience. So there's actually a very heated discussion in the in the chat. So I guess when is the first uh, two clarification? Uh, one thing uh, uh, to summarize is in re regarding the kinematics. So you show that in the first part is out of phase, like a pitching foil, and the second part is more like in phase. There's also heave, uh, like uh, um, pitching. So the, 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 I guess the, the, the several question like ask like similar in the direction is like uh, whether this in phase, out of phase, maybe like you know even random phase also heave will also end up with similar. Um, force mapping or similar scaling law? Like, have you seen just like in your, in your, in your work? Yeah, so I think, um, so thinking about the heaving motion first, right? When we did the potential flow simulations, there is a heave recoil motion in those simulations that is introduced passively, right? It's introduced just based on the hydrodynamic forces acting on the foil. So we only prescribe the pitching motion, but it does recoil. So when it flaps downward, it will get pushed upward in a little bit of heave motion. So in fact, in those simulations, it is effectively combined heaving and pitching where the phase difference is zero basically between the, the heaving and pitching motion. And in those cases, um, we still see the stable side-by-side -side arrangement, right? And in the experiments too, for the, the, the unconstrained foil, it also has some heaving recoil motions as well. So at least within that kind of framework, we're showing that some kind of change in the kinematics in terms of introducing some heave recoil doesn't seem to disrupt the stability landscape that we have from constrained measurements. Now, is that always going to be the case? You know, I don't know without doing a really comprehensive study on, you know, if we change the, the dimensionless mass of the swimmer, it's going to affect how much recoil the swimmer gets and changes the amount of heave. And at some point, potentially, it will break the, the solution. But I will say that I had a master's student who looked at changing the dimensionless mass he changed it for a wide range and it changed where the equilibrium position was located at, but it didn't change the fact that it existed. So um, at least for some cases we've seen that that hasn't made a major difference. Now the phase relationship, the synchronization is a big deal, I think. So we know that for the out of phase case, we get the stability point, but I, we don't know yet what happens as we change the synchrony. Um, and I'm imagining that the equilibrium point either could disappear or it could move to be not in a side-by-side -side arrangement. Okay, that's a very good like answer. I think it did even answer some like a question I have raised, like in, hopefully I'll answer your question, how Tim. So let me open the floor, like uh, Petro, I don't know if you're still there. So I think you have raised like a couple of like, interesting questions, but also comment. So if you want to raise the question like yourself. Okay, if not, oh, oh, go ahead. Oh, sorry. sorry, yeah, go ahead. Um, so yeah. just to say that your presentation was fantastic. Uh, it, it was very, very interesting. Um, talking a bit about your, your force marks at the beginning, they really reminded me a bit about this Lagrangian coherent structure framework developed by Haller. Is there any connection between the two? Could you sort of run FTLE and compare it to see if, the, if there's something there? Well, um... So I haven't done a lot with the with ground and current structure side of things. Um, from what I've seen, if I understand correctly, uh, that is based off of the velocity field, right? And here we're, we're based off of, it's a relative force field. Um, so it's different in a sense, but is there a connection? There, there very well could be a connection because you're talking about these kind of attractor uh, manifolds and, and uh, so forth. So, so it, it has like a feeling very similar to what we're seeing there. But I don't, we've, we've never tried to make that connection. And so I'm not quite sure. But I will say that they're based on two different fields, right? One's the force field and one's the flow field. So, you know, I'm not sure what that connection would be offhand. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much. And then the second question asks you, I, I think like um, it, it, it is in the non-linearity where your results at the end start to sort of diverge. Could you maybe use Cindy to find different non-linear terms? Because maybe that's where, where you could really get some improvement. Yeah, I, I um, yes. I think if we take a closer look at the feature vector and start to think about what other nonlinear features might be better and using the kind of approach, the sparse approach that you're talking about, Cindy, yeah, I mean, we could definitely potentially get better features that do better. I mean, we know that from our own scaling laws, the physical based scaling laws, that it's more complicated than just one over d star squared, right? And so, you know, presumably there, there, there is a better nonlinear feature choice that can give you a more accurate solution. We haven't dug into that too much yet, um, but I think it's an interesting direction to go. We did actually look at Cindy briefly, and we also tried, what was it? There was some lasso technique I think we tried as well to kind of give us some, um, you know, more uh, a, a sparser set of these features. One thing we have found, I will say, is that the, the positive powers don't really work very well. So <laughs> that's not, it's not too surprising, but, but it, the problem is really when you go to like D star to the fourth power, if your distances are large, that gets to be very large numbers. It just makes those terms very sensitive to the weightings in the neural network. And so those definitely should be dropped for sure. And there's not a lot of physical basis for that anyway. Thank you very much. That was fantastic. Um, yep, no problem. So uh, I see Professor Zhang Xing is like raised hand, but allow me first bundle a couple of questions first, like for peace. Again, so basically there's like a focus on the deep learning part. Like, uh, uh, so there's like a, you're trying to extend it like from two to three to four, but also there's also question for like, you know, the uh, tandem or like stack like, you no know, configuration. So, yes. so yes. Um, do you think it's possible for deep learning to like a uh, predict like flow structure, uh, also force as a flow structure as well as like more complicated, like, you know, uh, kinematics and like, you know, arrangement, so. Yeah, I'll say that we're, we're uh... We've only just you know started in this direction and we've chosen the simplest possible school right we've chosen purely pitching swimmers we've chosen well even now just missing simulations to keep it really simple we've chosen one phase value for all the swimmers uh so so yeah it's super simple we're just scaling up the number of swimmers in this one particular side-by-side -side arrangement if we wanted to predict what's happening in a more complex school, we need at least some training data that captures those interaction physics. So if we wanted to do a kind of inline case, we would at least need some training data of inline cases to be able to do that. Um, and and that, I should say that training data doesn't have to necessarily be actual simulation data. If we had scaling laws for it, right, we could use that as a, as a potential training um, element that could, that could give us the scale up effect too. So there's some thoughts in that direction. Um, you know, we're trying to do this really direct force kind of in a sense of brute force model, right? We have the distances between the swimmers and we're trying to calculate directly the thrust of the lift. Um, we could think about other approaches where maybe we introduce flow elements like, um, you know, doublets or, or vortices and maybe try to train uh, the, to find the strengths of those um, based on different flow configurations and maybe have a more flow-based approach to then doing calculating the forces from. So there are other approaches that could be considered um, that are less direct from what we're doing now that could be very beneficial. Uh, there's a lot to do in this realm, right? So I think, you know, we're just getting started here and I think uh, other people probably have great ideas of what to kind of do in this realm too. So if I may say like, you know, I, I forgot who told me this. Here comes algorithm A, here comes algorithm B, here goes algorithm B, but data still like is the essence of everything. So like, uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so, if you don't have anyway, if you don't have the right data, right? You're not going to get anywhere. And so, like, you have to you have to have some something about the interactions has to be in the data already. So that that that's clear. Yeah. So, given the time limitation, let me give like one last question to like Professor Zhang Xing, like you know, who raised hand. If you, if you can like uh, directly answer the question. Uh, uh, sorry, ask the question though. Oh, okay. Okay. Uh, now this is a really nice talk. And my question is is that uh, is the leader always constrained is that true is that leader is always constrained depends um in our in our experiments our leader was constrained in our simu in our potential flow simulations both the leader and follower were fully unconstrained in the two translational degree of freedoms so the okay. reason why in our experiments the leader is constrained is because it's difficult enough to do one follower on a dual access air bearing system 
much less to try to do two uh, dual access air bearing systems to have both fully end constrained. And so it's kind of a compromise, if you will, right? It's not fully constrained. It's, they're not both fully unconstrained, but one is fully unconstrained. And so that's kind of the in-between state we settled on that was a reasonable approach. But you could do it. It's, it's possible. It's very challenging to do that experimentally. But sim in the simulation world, it's not that it's not hard, right? You can do two fully unconstrained swimmers, and we did in our, our potential flow simulation case. And, and in, in the experiment, the, the follower is unconstrained. Yes. Right. Uh, then um, did you adjust the incoming flow velocity? So the, um, uh, the velocity should be adjusted according to the, um, uh, the velocity if the leader is, the, the, uh, the constraint on the leader is removed, you, you may get a cruising velocity. Then did you adjust the incoming velocity according to this cruising yeah. velocity or just a random, you choose a random velocity as an incoming velocity? Yes, you, you definitely need to adjust the incoming flow velocity. Um, we know that that was going to be the case because we're going to get, we measured, you know, a thrust benefit. So we know that the two, both the leader and follower are going to achieve higher swimming speeds when they're swimming together. Um, so yes, you do have to adjust the, the flow speed in order to have anything make sense, really. Or okay. else there's, there's, a net, there's a net force condition left over on the leader. So that's, yeah. Mm -hmm. And another small question is that how, how do you measure the thrust on the body that is unconstrained? How do you measure the thrust? We don't. We don't measure the thrust on the body that's unconstrained. If, it, if it's generating more thrust, it swims forward, right? And if it's generating less thrust, it gets pulled back in the flow. Um, and so it's, it's, um, it's an, you have an indicator in that sense. But, but we don't measure the thrust directly since it is in a, a force-free condition. We don't measure that directly. Now, I will say uh, that we... We actually, you saw maybe in one of the videos, we introduced some mm. drag generating bodies. Um, and the reasoning there is that if it's just a foil and it's free swimming, it's screw hole number will be something really, really low. Um, whereas if it's an actual fish, there's a body that in introduces some drag and it actually um, will slow down the, the speed uh, of the swimmer so that the screw hole number is actually higher and in a more normal you know, uh, range. So we do introduce these drag generating bodies that are way off on the side, so they don't interact with the, in the unsteady flow scenario happening, but they do generate drag and, and they um, set the screw hole number to be in the range we would expect. Okay, thank you. Yep. Okay, uh, although I have multiple questions, but I think I give it a time and, uh, and, and also give the like, you know, the uh, like, you know, I think Keith may want to like drink some water and take a rest. So, um, so with that, like, I want to say thank you again for your wonderful talks and um, for also for the audience who I haven't touched your question, you're more than welcome to like, I think like Keith will be happy if you send him a mail like with like a terrific questions like, you know, to follow up. So uh, thank you again, Keith, for this wonderful talk and uh, hopefully like uh, the people will have, have enjoyed that. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was nice, uh, nice giving a talk here in the seminar series. Okay, stay safe, stay healthy for everybody. So, bye, peace. See you later.